Uh, vriendelijk vragen om uh, plaats te nemen, dan zouden wij het seminar beginnen. Distinguished guests, Burggraven Dirk Vreemald en Frank de Winne, geachte administrateur-generaal, beste professoren, ladies and gentlemen, Dames en heren, van harte welkom op het seminarium van de Vlaamse ruimtevaartsector. Laat mij alvorens te beginnen twee bijzondere landgenoten in de bloemetjes zetten. Wij hebben de eer om vandaag niet één, maar twee astronauten in ons midden te hebben. Op 24 maart, gisteren dus, was het exact 30 jaar geleden dat Dirk Vreemald als eerste Belg met de Amerikaanse Space Shuttle Atlantis een vlucht naar de ruimte maakte. En tien jaar later, in 2002, zou Frank de Winne ruim acht dagen aan boord van het internationaal ruimtestation ISS verblijven. Beide vluchten hebben de interesse voor ruimtevaart in ons land enorm sterk aangewakkerd. En uh, ze hebben het belang van de ruimtevaarttechnologie en onderzoek in de verf gezet en daarmee ook de unieke bijdrage van de Belgische industrie en de Belgische onderzoekers in dit domein belicht. Jullie vlucht blijft ons ook vandaag nog altijd inspireren. En de aandacht voor ruimtevaart is nooit groter geweest dan eerder, naar mijn gevoel. Als ambassadeur spelen jullie daarin ook nog een heel belangrijke rol. En we zijn dan ook heel verheugd om jullie aanwezig te hebben hier op het seminarium van de Vlaamse ruimtevaartindustrie. Dank u wel daarvoor. Ik wil van de gelegenheid ook gebruik maken om de, de KUL uh, te bedanken dat ons seminar kon plaatsvinden in dit prachtige kader. Uh, tot slot uh, bedank ik namens de VRI-leden ook de mensen van de universiteit en het team van professor Connie Aerts, die mee de schouders onder de organisatie gezet hebben en vandaag voor een vlekkeloos verloop uh, zorgen. Vandaag hebben we een... Uh, een mooi programma. Uh, we starten uh, nu. Uh, er is een, een eerste deel uh, dat uh, gestart wordt door een boodschap van minister Krevits, uh, die uh, spijtig genoeg uh, vandaag toch niet aanwezig kon zijn. Maar ze heeft een boodschap opgenomen uh, op video die we straks zullen uh, afspelen. Dan is er een keynote speech van uh, Frank de Winne. Uh, dan hebben we het over space exploration, how to live on Mars. The role of ease and supporting SMEs and the commercialization of space. Een koffiebreak van uh, een dertigtal minuten in de jubileumzaal, hier een beetje verder, waar ook de jobfair doorgaat. En dan in het namiddag, uh, of het tweede deel van het programma, focussen we op de downstream applications uh, in, in het uh, veld van aardobservatie. Wat het betekent uh, een start-up te zijn in space, in het uh, Vlaams landschap. Uh, waarom een, een carrière in de ruimtevaart heel fascinerend is en de Master in Space Studies en een, uh, een voordracht van een uh, jonge ingenieur uh, die dan ook uh, space en het stemonderwijs voor studenten in uh, derde graad uh, secundair onderwijs uh, even in de kijker zetten. En dan uh, om zes uur start er een receptie uh, in dezelfde jubileumzaal waarop jullie uiteraard allemaal uitgenodigd zijn. Ikzelf ben Koen Puimege, de voorzitter van de Vlaamse ruimtevaartindustrie. En ik ga jullie kort eventjes toelichten waar we staan vandaag in Vlaanderen met ruimtevaart. Wel, voor de mensen die er hier aanwezig zijn, die er waarschijnlijk nog deel van waren. De VRI is gestart in 1995 door een, een, vijf, een elftal leden. De objectieven waren om de samenwerking tussen spelers in de ruimtevaart te bevorderen. Het uh, verder uh, stimuleren van uh, Vlaamse bedrijven die meewerken aan Europese en internationale spaceprogramma's. En ook de sector vertegenwoordigen naar uh, de Belspo-administratie uh, voor de ESA-programma's, ESA zelf en ook de programma's uh, van de Europese Unie. Uh, VRI was uh, opgericht als een uh, representatieve organisatie uh, voor alle Vlaamse space-actoren. 27 jaar later ondertussen is VRI enorm gegroeid en enorm gediversifieerd. So if we look a bit to the turnover of VRI, uh, you can easily see that we look back on a very successful period over the past years since uh, the early 80s. 
The total turnover of the members has been growing continuously since the 80s. Uh, today we have about 1,300 direct jobs in our uh, sector in Flanders. And uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, leverage of the ESA programs is still a very important factor also in the total revenue uh, or turnover uh, of the space sector uh, beyond uh, the ESA programs. The space sector is a sector like any other sector today. Uh, it is uh, also uh, suffering, of course, from some pandemic effects. But it's also very clear that uh, this sector is very resilient. Uh, it's very crisis-proof and it continues to grow despite uh, the difficulties of the last uh, two years. So that was also very pleasant uh, to observe. And next to the industrial actors, uh, today they are also very capable universities and uh, knowledge uh, centers active in uh, Flanders. This slide gives uh, an overview of the members today. It's quite a big group. We are today uh, 42 members of uh, Flemish uh, space players, and that's an increase of about 30% in the last uh, five years. People who would like to find more information on each of these uh, individual uh, companies and institutes can uh, check the Flanders uh, website uh, uh, for more information. Now, what is important to understand, I believe, when you look to Flanders, is how our members are situated all across the value chain. Uh, on one hand, we have very strong competences in Flanders in space research, toxics, effects of radiation on humans and electronics, exoplanets, astronomy, astrophysics, and fluid dynamics are very key knowledge available uh, in Flanders. Uh, then we have players active in the upstream uh, segment, so construction of satellites, including the subsystems of very big satellites, uh, down to the level of components, uh, but also construction of the ground stations, launches, and launching services are actually uh, industrial competences available uh, in Flanders today. Then there is the downstream sector, where production and installation of user terminals, but also application development and data processing, next to actual services relating to communication, earth observation, and remote sensing, are where important players are uh, very active today. And last but not least, uh, venture creation and entrepreneurship is also very much uh, stimulated in Belgium. We do have uh, programs for spin-ins, spin-outs, and seed funding, which are uh, active uh, today as well. Now, this is, of course, important at the European level. That's obvious. Um, all our players are very active in the European space market. So there is, on one hand, the European Space Agency, where uh, Flanders delivers uh, onboard equipment like cameras, solar arrays, computers, radio equipment, triple E components, and so on, uh, are also active in various uh, disciplines of the space domain, like telecommunication, earth observation, and navigation markets, to name a few. But also, uh, Flanders has collaborated a lot on very special missions, like uh, space weather, proba -V, small satellites uh, for vegetation uh, purpose, uh, Cassini-Huygens, uh, we go to Mars, to Jupiter, with uh, Flemish uh, equipment. And we also work on the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, uh, Telescope. And historically, we have a very strong foot also in everything related to human spaceflight in the International Space Station, microgravity research, and robotic exploration, amongst others. Uh, now, more important also today, more and more, is the programs of the European Union. Uh, and there also Flanders is uh, involved in European flagship programs like Galileo, Copernicus, and Govsatcom. Uh, but uh, also we see that Flemish industry is positioning uh, very well on the new initiatives that are arising, like, uh, for example, the satellite-based connectivity system that is now uh, coming up. So it's, it's fair to say, I believe, that space has become really an economic sector. Uh, it moved from uh, institutional scientific research to becoming a, a full-blown economic sector in all dimensions today. There are disruptions, of course. Uh, new space is uh, one example. It's a global disruption in the commercialization of space. We see also in our context uh, new players that are emerging, established players that uh, 
adapt their supply chain to stay competitive and ahead of competition. It is quite a challenge uh, to do so, uh, given, given the, the global uh, importance of that. Um, similar challenges uh, exist also in our sector uh, compared to other sectors like uh, supply chain shortages due to COVID-19. We face those uh, export barriers due to geopolitical situation today and uh, definitely there is also a very uh, strong uh, war for talent, uh, talent uh, definitely in Flanders but uh, also in Belgium and Europe uh, as a whole. An OECD study finds out that space today is uh, having still or even more a multiplicator effect. It's an engine for innovation and economic growth. It has a social impact and it offers a seal of excellence. And I do believe that space is a sector with a societal impact. There is a direct impact, uh, for example, internet connectivity in remote regions, combating uh, the digital divide uh, of today. Uh, connectivity for means of transport, logistics, in land, sea, air. Uh, European sovereignty, an important topic nowadays. Safety and resilience of communication and positioning. Uh, and I do believe the space sector contributes to several sustainable United Nations development goals like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, clean water and sanitation and climate action as one of uh, the very important ones to mention. Indirectly, uh, there is definitely a, a development of advanced skills and innovation uh, resulting from the many space projects and initiatives that we do. Uh, there is a motivation of young people to follow a scientific training. We will have some testimonies today uh, relating to the STEM uh, education. And I do believe that space keeps on inspiring people and societies to dare to dream, which is, I believe, something we all need uh, today. So zooming in a little bit on the Flemish aspect, uh, today we are driving towards a Flemish space strategy. It started in 2017 with the VARIO advice, uh, which was an initiative to find the role and the place uh, of space in the Flemish economy. Out of that advice, we started uh, in 2018 for three years uh, cluster working called uh, IBDM Space uh, 4.0, which was actually putting into place the VARIO advice and led to the creation of Flanders Space uh, end of last year, which is an initiative supported by our minister uh, Hilde Krevitz, which will basically exploit the Flemish competences and bring added value and multiplicator effects in space. Uh, there we can now say um, that we have also received a Flemish budget for space, which is uh, 11 million. Um, so this will allow uh, the Flanders Space Initiative to start develop a true space economy in Flanders. It's obviously a first step, uh, and uh, we do hope that it will lead to further funding uh, in this area in the near future to further accelerate uh, the possibilities that exist of using space assets today for uh, several uh, services that do matter uh, to the society. Obviously, looking outside of uh, Flanders, uh, there is a, a continuous uh, strong position in Europe and we have to make sure that we stay uh, ahead of competition there. So the federal space budget of 250 million per year will require an additional injection of about 70 million per year to remain ahead and to support also the many new players that become uh, very active uh, in Flanders. Uh, globally, investment in space, I believe, have never been so high. There is a, a high return on investment uh, in this uh, mature sector today uh, for governments to invest and uh, strategic interest, but also sovereignty needs uh, drive the scene, I believe, today and stimulate uh, further investments in this area. In uh, Europe, I believe it's important that we play on our strengths, and we do have very specific strengths in Flanders relating to earth observation, telecommunication, also human and robotic exploration, critical components, uh, and scientific research, uh, not to name a few. Local leverage creation through space entrepreneurship and technology transfer is definitely also important to create spin-in and spin-out of all the work we do 
and is also happening uh, today in Flanders. Uh, and the political support to further increase the intra-Belgian return in favor of Flanders to a percentage of 56% is also remains a point of attention. And my last slide is maybe a key message to our policymakers. I believe as a small region, we are at the top of Europe today in space. We work in various niche areas where we basically are very good. And um, I think we have an opportunity here to create more leverage on regional, national and European investment. But the R&D budgets are still insufficient to valorize all the project proposals that exist from the sector, despite a uh, return on investment that is uh, always higher than three, three times the amount invested by uh, a government. Uh, there are also still barriers to uh, raise risk capital for space. Uh, I think we have to do more there in Flanders, but also in Europe. Uh, I believe uh, uh, we had a discussion with Jens at the table uh, at lunch. Uh, also, ESA is working heavily uh, on making this uh, possible in the future. And there is definitely a war for talent that is slowing down the growth of many uh, space companies uh, in, in Flanders. Uh, and together with that, we still have some administrative burdens or obstacles to employ non-EU uh, workers uh, that, uh, that could also be resolved, uh, I believe, in the future. So restrictions on, restrictions on dual use components will have to be re-evaluated to facilitate export. And uh, I believe there is also a role for the Flemish administration to, become, to take a more important role in becoming an anchor customer for developing um, applications where space assets are used to support uh, our Flemish administration. And uh, being an anchor customer can help the industry then to further export uh, these services on a European uh, or worldwide scale. You can think about uh, food crisis management, digitalization, uh, and so on. I thank you for your attention. And uh, I would like to uh, switch now uh, to uh, the video message of uh, our minister, uh, Hilde Krevitz, so the Flemish Minister for Economy, Innovation, Work, Social Economy, and uh, Agriculture. Ruimtevaart liefhebbers. Weinig dingen inspireren jong en oud zoveel als de ruimtevaart. Astronauten, space shuttles, telescopen, planeten en kometen of natuurlijk films zoals Interstellar of Star Wars. Wat veel minder mensen weten is dat ook Vlaanderen een kleine maar zeer bloeiende ruimtevaartsector heeft. Heel wat Vlaamse bedrijven en instellingen zijn Europees of zelfs wereldleider geworden in producten of diensten in de ruimtevaart. Wist u bijvoorbeeld dat de koppelingsmechanismen van het ISS werken met Vlaamse technologie van Kinetic Space of dat het Zadentemse bedrijf Space Application Services de zeer populaire ice cubes ontwikkelde? Dat zijn kleine kubussen voor minilabs die kunnen worden gebruikt in het ISS. Het was zelfs een Vlaams bedrijf verhaard dat in 2001 de eerste Europese satelliet ontwierp en bouwde en lanceerde voor ESA, de PROBA. En dan heb ik het nog niet over de belangrijke rol die het Molse Nucleaire Onderzoekscentrum SCK speelt in het ontwikkelen van de Europese ruimtepakken. De ruimtevaartsector is een hoogtechnologische sector die vaak baanbrekend onderzoek verricht en een motor is voor innovatie en economische groei. Maar ook voor ons dagelijks leven is de sector zeer relevant. Veel voorwerpen en technologieën die wij vandaag vanzelfsprekend vinden, worden mogelijk gemaakt door ruimtevaarttechnologie. Denk aan het internet, de gsm of onze gps. Ook om grote uitdagingen zoals klimaatverandering en de veranderingen op vlak van mobiliteit aan te pakken, zal ruimtevaarteconomie onontbeerlijk zijn. Denk aan satellietdata of aardobservatiedata, die veranderingen aan het aardoppervlak rapporteren of die ingezet worden voor positionering telecommunicatie of meteorologie. Voor veel sectoren, gaande van landbouw tot defensie, bieden de ruimtevaartdata dus een heel grote meerwaarde. De economische en maatschappelijke return wordt vaak onderschat. 
Zo is de gecumuleerde omzet van de Vlaamse ruimtevaartindustrie groter dan 350 miljoen euro. Het gaat daarbij meestal om hoogopgeleide mensen in jobs met een grote toegevoegde waarde. Vandaar dat we in het Vlaams regeerakkoord 1924 de ambitie opgenomen hebben om ruimtevaart een meer prominente plaats te geven in ons Vlaams beleid. Op 2 april 2021 hebben we een impulsprogramma goedgekeurd voor de volgende jaren. In dat programma werken we een eigen beleid uit rond ruimtevaart. Dat is nodig om onze positie nog te versterken op Europees en federaal niveau. Het impulsprogramma ruimtevaarteconomie bestaat uit vijf delen. Ten eerste de Vlaamse ruimtevaarteconomie ondersteunen via het platform van Vlaamse Space. Ten tweede een heel belangrijk stemtalent, technologisch talent, leiden naar de ruimtevaart, want we hebben alle talenten nodig. Ten derde ondernemerschap en concurrentiekracht in de sector versterken. Ten vierde deelname aan internationale ruimtevaartprogramma's stimuleren en stroomlijnen. En tot slot bouwen aan een sterke wetenschapscommunicatie. Voor de komende vijf jaar voorzien we in 11 miljoen euro om dit programma uit te rollen. Vandaag zullen jullie hierover ook nog meer details vernemen. Maar ik wil alle betrokkenen in naam van de Vlaamse regering graag nu al bedanken om de schouders onder dit ambitieuze project te zetten. Tegelijk wil ik alle jongeren in de zaal oproepen om je te laten inspireren door de grenzeloze mogelijkheden van de ruimtevaart om te kiezen voor een carrière in de ruimtevaart als dat kan. Zo kunnen jullie meebouwen aan de Vlaamse ruimtevaart van de toekomst en jullie talenten inzetten voor een betere samenleving. Heel veel succes. Dan zou ik nu heel graag het woord geven aan Frank de Winne, hoofd van het ESA Europees Astronaut Center. Alsjeblieft, Frank. Dank u wel, Koen. Uh, goedemiddag allemaal. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, we just learned that uh, Minister Krivitz is a fan of Star Wars. I'm a fan of Star Trek. So, uh, Captain Kirk, uh, this was one of the reasons why I wanted to become an astronaut, because he had this big chair, and he could sit in the chair and say, warp nine, engage. Uh, I always wanted to do that as well. Unfortunately, we don't have work capability yet uh, in our society, but maybe one day we will have work capability, who knows. Uh, nevertheless, I had the privilege and I was lucky enough to become an astronaut and to become the commander of the space station. So maybe it was only a very small step, uh, but I'm sure that the investment of uh, Belgium and the investment of Flanders and the Flanders industry uh, into that endeavor was uh, certainly very important and, and was a key factor uh, for me to be able to have that, uh, that privilege. And you mentioned uh, some successes, uh, Kuhn, uh, and some industries that were there in the beginning. Uh, I know for my first flight, which was now 20 years ago, which we are also celebrating uh, today, there were a lot of the industries that were here, Verhaart at that moment that you mentioned, that in the meantime has become kinetic, that were instrumental in uh, setting up the scientific program for this first flight. And also there we did a lot of outreach to the new generation and to the new talent. So the fact that we have grown in Flanders, in Belgium, uh, I, uh, of course makes me extremely happy. Uh, but uh, I think we need to make the next step. It's not only me that thinks that need to make the next, next step. We have since uh, uh, March last year, we have a new director general in ESA that has published his agenda 2025. That is of course his agenda, but has supported and has been developed together with a lot of people inside ESA. Uh, and we leave it's time for accelerating space in Europe. You mentioned it, Dirk, uh, space is uh, very active all around the world. Uh, more and more actors become active, uh, not only uh, commercial actors or industries, but also countries. Uh, more and more countries have their space assets in Europe, uh, in, in, have their assets in space, can fly to space and are investing at increasing amounts of money. And so if in Europe we want to keep up, we want to keep the talent here that you also mentioned, 
uh, that they, you talked about getting talent from abroad, but we also have to see that our talent does not leave uh, uh, Belgium to go and work in more interesting domains uh, or where they have more career opportunities abroad. It's absolutely important that we accelerate space in Europe. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, it's a speech uh, or, or uh, some view graphs, of course, that we have developed together in, in Europe, and some of you might have uh, seen it already or heard it already if they were part of uh, presentation of my director general uh, that is uh, happily talking about this uh, as much as possibly possible. So first of all, the European Space Agency, where are we today? Well, uh, we have a big workforce in ESA with specialists, more than 5,500 people are working directly for ESA as myself or indirectly as, uh, as contractor workforce. Uh, we have developed more than 85 missions that we have flown, uh, and we have really pushed the limits uh, since 1975. Uh, think about some uh, extraordinary missions that we have done. Cassini-Huygens, for example, that has landed on Titan, or uh, Planck that has uh, made the, big, the first pictures from the, the Big Bang from the early universe. Yeah. We have now 22 member states, not only VRE has grown. Uh, when, we, uh, when I joined ESA, I think we had 12 member states, now we have 22. And it's uh, growing because we have three associate member states and one cooperative member state, so it will grow. And also the budget is uh, increasingly growing uh, in ESA uh, to uh, 7.313 uh, billion for the 22 budget. So that's quite uh, uh, a big amount. We had an increasingly amount, a lot of support for the member states in the last ministerial conference in space 19 plus, uh, where we had about, I think if I remember well, 12 billion euros budget, which was a, a significant increase for this ministerial. The, the request that we will make to the ministers will be close to 16 billion. So you can also there see that from the institutional part, as you mentioned it, uh, 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 we, we are planning to have a big increase in the budget to support, of course, our industry. Now, nevertheless, even with all these increases, you see that European excellence and leadership is under pressure. Uh, if you see the, the money that is spent in the USA and in, in Russia, even in Saudi Arabia, compared, of course, to that GDP, which is a lot smaller, but still, uh, in ESA and the EU and the member states, we are somewhere in the middle. Yeah? We, we are not at the, the biggest spenders on our space budget. Uh, and certainly, if you look to the, to the spacecraft and to the, the amount of launches that we do or, or spacecraft that we put on orbit, you see that ESA is really small compared to, for example, China, uh, Russia, and the USA, which is, of course, driven a lot by national security and by the military, that's clear. Uh, but still, we are a, a, a small player there. So if we want to maintain in the lead of this uh, very great developing uh, endeavor and economic sector, as you also mentioned, Kuhn, that space is now really becoming a truly economic sector, we need to do something. So our director general created a high-level advisory group with uh, former uh, DGs from space agencies, but also with uh, politicians uh, and with people from the societal background to say, okay, what should the role of ESA be? What should the role of space be in Europe in this, uh, uh, in this global context and with all these emerging challenges that we have, such as new space and uh, new economic uh, or, or commercial companies? So there, there were a number of uh, recommendations, and you will see that they are very much aligned with uh, the previous speaker as well. Uh, first of all, uh, space can bring more solutions to all the societal challenges that we have. The first thing, of course, that uh, jumps to mind is uh, climate change, but there are also others that are very, uh, I would say, prominent today. Think about uh, safety and security. Think about uh, disaster management. Uh, we need to create new tools that can aggregate resources for concrete solutions. Today, uh, and it's very clear as well in the view graph that uh, the VRE presented, uh, in the beginning, almost the whole revenue or, or the turnover of uh, uh, Flemish industry was ESA budget. And if you see now, there is a big gap. So that means that there is a lot of other uh, 
uh, money flowing into the sector. Uh, we just uh, heard uh, Minister Kravitz saying that uh, there is an initial budget of 11 million from the, the Flemish government as well now being spent in space. So how can we create tools so that we can all bring this together and, and to, to find concrete solutions for the problems that we have? Uh, the recommendations also said, well, there are three domains where you really need to start accelerating the use of space. And they're called as three accelerators, and we will come back to them later. And we should use a stepwise approach to implement those accelerators, because again, they will not be implemented, or it will not be another ESA program where we get institutional funding and we fund uh, the traditional industry as we used to do. This is meant to be something different. Uh, but we also want to inspire. Uh, inspiration was already mentioned a couple of times. Uh, Dirk, uh, with his uh, flight, certainly inspired a, young of, a lot of young Belgian people that are now working or active in the space flight, I hope, uh, in the space sector. I hope that uh, mine did so as well. I was talking to kids this morning, uh, 10 to 12 years old. The, the room was full. They had plenty of questions. So we hope to continue to inspire. And inspire, of course, we need astronauts, we need uh, science, we need new things that can really attract the attention of the public. So that's why we are also will prepare two inspirators, which I will talk about. Uh, but we cannot do this, as said, again, in the classical way. The world around us is changing, so we need to do this in a more commercialized approach. It needs to be user-driven, and it needs, needs to focus on the human capital and the STEM that we will need for to implement all these programs. Again, the war on talent is real. It's not just a slogan that Kuhn mentioned. It's something that is, is real. And of course, uh, I think this is also very uh, active or, or very, uh, I would say, uh, prominent in today's language that we see from our European leaders. We want, I don't think that we only want, we need a stronger Europe in, in a better world. Uh, and maybe in a better world, I would even say a stronger Europe for a better world. I think this is very important and space can help there. So what are the three accelerators? The three accelerators are space for a green future. Uh, we all know that climate change is real. And if we want to become energy independent and, and help the world, uh, we need to accelerate there. Uh, we also have seen the disasters in Belgium, in Germany, uh, due to the uh, uh, climate change uh, that brought uh, real disasters for billions and billions of damages in infrastructure, loss of life. So can we have a more rapid and resilient crisis response uh, in, uh, supported by space? And of course, in order to do that, if we have all those assets in space that will help us, we need to continue to protect them, our European assets in space. And then the, the two inspirators is uh, European Human Access to Space. And so far, we are strategic, independent in that we can launch our own satellites to space, but we don't have a European vehicle that can launch European astronauts to space. Do we want that or not? Uh, and then the last one is an icy moon return sample mission. Uh, one of the most prominent or that scientists think that there is chances for real life in our solar system is maybe on the icy moons where under the surface there is water, water at ambient uh, temperature, pressures that uh, are compatible with life. So is there life underneath there and can we try to take a sample from those seas and bring them back to, to Earth? So uh, the accelerators, indeed, it's really a new concept because it will focus on the response on the responding urgent societal needs so that's really the driver what are the urgent societal needs for Europe uh, it's about upscaling existing investments in space so it's not about uh, just bringing a new program uh, but what is already existing how can we scale this up and can, can we bring it to the next uh, level uh, because it's uh, managing or it's responding to urgent societal needs, the user, of course, needs to be at the center. Yeah? What are those needs? What does the user need? And how can we respond to that? We mentioned already a couple of times uh, European leadership and, and STEM, but also attracting new uh, funding sources. New funding sources can be funding sources from regions, so like uh, announced by Minister Kravitz, but it can also be investments from uh, uh, people uh, that uh, uh, see that they have a business case in the future 
for their space investments, uh, like, for example, the Elon Musk's or the Jeff Bezos uh, are doing in the United States. But it can also be investments that are more coming from investment funds, uh, that we see that return in space, uh, as we said, it's three times uh, the return in space. So why should investment funds and institutions like the European Investment Bank, for example, not be interested in supporting our businesses, our SMEs, and our new companies in investing in this, uh, uh, in this new endeavor. So it will combine the strengths of ESA because we can provide the knowledge, we can provide uh, the, the project management that we, uh, for large projects that we are used to do. Uh, the EU, of course, with the political support, the member states also with their funding, but also the commercial sector. Uh, so what is the added value uh, of that? The added value is that uh, if we see a real need and we really want to uh, accelerate and we can really bring projects together, uh, we can bring all the talents around a common cause. And we have seen this in the COVID-19 vaccine development, that there was a real need, there was a real urge, and nobody believed when we started this that we could develop a COVID-19 vaccine in, in a year or a little bit over a year. And yet today, two, two years in the pandemic, we can sit here, all, most of us, without masks, uh, mostly because we have these vaccines uh, available. So this is really something that uh, we need to do, that, that we are sure that Europe is capable of doing, uh, but we need uh, indeed the drive, we need uh, this framework around which we can all work uh, together. So uh, this was accepted, so this endorsement or these recommendations from uh, the Wiseman Group was adopted by the ministers uh, in 2021 uh, with the uh, Matoshinhoz Mani Manifesto, it's a difficult name, I don't know why they, they selected this town to do this uh, ministerial conference, really, really much too difficult for me. Um, but it held, was held 18th and 19th uh, November, uh, so if you want to see what a little bit the future of space looks like and what our ministers have decided that, uh, this is readily available on the internet, I really recommend you to read this document, it's not so long, but it's very interesting. Yeah, uh, but even more so, uh, after the the space uh, after the ministerial conference, ESA was able, together with the EU, to organize a space summit. This was the first time in Europe that a space summit was organized at the level of uh, of the heads of state. And we see here uh, our director general with uh, the commissioner Breton, uh, but also with President Macron that uh, there give a very inspiring speech, which is, by the way, also online, uh, in French, of course, but uh, a, a very inspiring speech of the future of space in Europe and why we need to continue to invest in Europe. So the, the ambitious plans were fully endorsed uh, by the, the senior leadership of Europe during this uh, space summit. So now what, what do we want to accelerate? Uh, space for a green future was the first one, as I said, uh, what is the cost of not accelerating? Well, it, to, to some uh, studies, if you refer to them, uh, at least 150 trillion, but maybe as much as uh, almost 800 trillion money could be lost by the end of the century if we don't mitigate climate change. Think about flooding, think about uh, the, the, the disasters that, that, that can come. So, uh, spending just a fraction of that money to mitigate it is, of course, in a very good in investment. So what do we do want to do? Well, we want to uh, create a digital twin earth. A lot of the uh, predictions that we today are making with, with climate change are based on uh, models that we have, but the models sometimes run separately. Can we make a digital twin of our earth so that we can completely simulate uh, what is happening with our planet. Uh, this, of course, will uh, require a lot of investment in computing, in modeling, uh, but also in sensors that we need, uh, sensors that will need to be deployed uh, in space, but also uh, on the ground. And from that digital twin earth, then we can have green information factories where uh, people that need for decision making can immediately get the information they need and can from there derive the actions that they can take in order to reduce uh, their impact on climate change. Uh, that will accelerate the decarbonization 
uh, that we absolutely need uh, to come to a net zero emissions by 2050 as, our, uh, as, as Europe has decided. One of the aspects that we absolutely need in order to do that, and that's a completely new scientific domain, is quantum gravity, uh, gravimetry. So basically uh, being able to model uh, the gravitational fields of our planet at, at a much more level of detail than we have done today, because that has an enormous impact on all the models that we are making. And only if we do that, we will be able to, to make the digital uh, twin earth. Uh, the second one is accelerating uh, uh, rapid and uh, resilient crisis responses. Uh, there again, uh, I think uh, here you see some pictures of the, the flooding that uh, happened uh, last, uh, last summer. So what, uh, what are we lacking? We are basically lacking the synergies of all the information and the combination of all the information that is available. Uh, we have Copernicus, we have all the data from our satellites, but can we connect this with the models? Can we connect this with uh, Galileo that has the, the positioning of uh, where everybody is? And can we have this also linked to the secure uh, connectivity flagship that the, ESA, that the, the EU is starting, uh, GovSatcom, so that all this information can be shared between all the people that are responsive for having a quick action response in case of a disaster. Uh, so that is something, of course, that we need, need to do. Uh, and we, of course, the, the interconnectivity there of all these systems, all this information together, uh, uh, together with the Internet of Things and together with artificial intelligence will make this possible. Uh, so, okay, I, I mentioned already uh, a little bit here. So really this integration of all this information is what is required. Uh, you see there AI, 6G as well, for example, that of course we will need in case that uh, the normal networks are not available. And then the, the, second the third acceleration is protecting of space assets. Uh, we all know the, the problem with space debris. And uh, you see here uh, a, a nice picture. It seems as if there is almost no more space available around our planet. It's, it's getting close to that. If we then think that uh, our uh, that there are companies, commercial companies today, like SpaceX, like uh, Amazon, like Facebook, uh, thinking about mega constellations, about tens of thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, uh, how will we manage this if those satellites are defunct? How will we get them back to the ground? Uh, what if there is a cascade effect uh, known as the Kepler effect that we get more and more collisions in space? So this is really something that is uh, uh, extremely important because we, our generation, have had the benefit of using space uh, for everything that we want to do. Uh, we have to be very careful that we don't do like uh, uh, my parents and my grandparents uh, did using a lot of the earth resources. And now your generation, a lot of the young people here will have to, to, to solve climate change. We need to be very careful that also my generation does not use space and then you guys have to go and clean up the mess in 20 or 30 years from now. So it's something that we need to start now and that is extremely important. Uh, so, of course, space debris, I talked about it, so we need to monitor it, we need to have warnings, we need to have avoidance capability, and we eventually need to have capabilities to remove or repair different uh, satellites. But it's not only space debris, it's also space weather. Uh, some of you might know, some might not. Elon Musk lost more than 40 satellites just after the launch, uh, I think, three, four weeks ago, if I don't uh, remember well, something like that, uh, because of a space weather event, a solar flare, all the satellites were lost just after launch. So this gives you the indication that this is not just a scientific solar weather, scientific kind of uh, 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 talk. It's, it's really having impact on the space system. So also there, we need to, to work on that. And then beyond that, of course, we have the, the two inspirators, human access to space, we see today that all nations uh, or all actors that want to play in the geopolitical field as, as big actors have their own independent access to space or are developing it. Uh, think about China, think about Russia, think about the US, but now also India is developing their own uh, access to space and they will soon have it probably in two years. They will also be able to fly their Indian astronauts to space. So the question is for Europe, 
uh, if you want to become a geopolitical player, like this is now set more and more by our uh, leadership in, in Europe to have uh, what they call strategic autonomy, thus human access to space is that part of strategic autonomy. This decision is not made, but there will be another group, high-level group, that will uh, look at this. Why should Europe do this? How should we do it? Because that's also the question. It's not only why, but also afterwards, how shall we do it? Uh, and then the decision will probably be taken at the next uh, space summit in 2023. And the other inspirator was, of course, more a scientific one oriented. There it's more to see if the member states indeed are willing to invest the necessary budget to come with a mission that has never been done before and bring IC samples back from, uh, from, samples back from an IC moon. Uh, uh, okay, I talked already about uh, this, I think. Uh, the freedom of action in space is, of course, uh, they're uh, very important, but also to unlock the commercial potential in Europe. After the International Space Station, there will probably not be an institutional space station anymore. Most likely, it will be a commercial space station. If we still want to do science, if we still want to do research in microgravity, which a lot of our institutes want to do, uh, how will we access those? How will we, will we just buy services and then all the European euros are flowing to companies across the ocean? Or, or to somewhere else, or do, want to, do we want to be part of this commercial endeavor? And how can we then position European industry in this new geo commercial uh, environment? And this is uh, one of the big topics uh, that uh, I'm currently uh, working on. Uh, and the other one, uh, as I saw, uh, said, is uh, bringing back uh, an, uh, a sample from an icy moon. Is there life out there? Uh, probably the most important uh, scientific question that we have not answered uh, yet uh, today, uh, but hopefully maybe in my lifetime we will find an answer uh, to that. So the journey has started uh, for this acceleration. Uh, we had had the, the EMM, the Space Summit. Uh, we will have a June Council, in, uh, a Space Council in June, uh, further detailing uh, the plans. Uh, we will have our ministerial conference in 2022 where we will ask for the initial budgets to start uh, accelerating this, uh, these topics. Uh, there will be a new space summit in 2023, where we will take stock and the, the leadership will take stock. And hopefully we will have a decision by then to also develop uh, European human access to space. And then, of course, once all this is done uh, at uh, CM2025, and that's, of course, linked to the Agenda 2025 of my Director General, we will have all instruments in place to really accelerate space in Europe. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, for uh, being part of the acceleration of space in Europe. Thank you, Kun. Dan zou ik graag nu onze volgende spreker aankondigen. I would like to announce the next speaker. That is Dr. Nathalie Leijs, coordinator of the Space Life Science Research Program at SEK SEN. Do we have? Ah, there you are. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Nathalie Les. I'm a bioengineer and an alumni of the KUL. I never thought I would be in this room where the uh, honorary doctorates are given uh, to also be able to speak. But the uh, inspiration for space is actually frank. When I got the opportunity in 2001 with his very first flight to give a package of science that he could do in the space station and 20 years later, I'm still fascinated and still working on that research. Uh, but yeah, what is um, a bioengineer? Uh, I'm working at the Nuclear Research Center, SEKCN. Um, and what is, well, what am I doing in space? Eh? You may ask. 
Um, so for me, space, of course, is exciting, fascinating. It makes your dreams. Uh, it makes you wonder. As a scientist, you want to explore. You want to know how it works, why it works. But above all, we should not forget it's also a very unique nuclear environment. So all these stars are actually nuclear reactors, fusion reactors, also our own sun which are spitting out radiation all the time. And so space is an environment with a lot of ionizing radiation, a very complex um, spectrum, different energies, which has an impact on all the instruments we send to space, but also the humans that travel to space. And uh, so it's part of our research is to, to figure out what is the impact and how can we deal with that especially when we aim for future exploration missions. Uh, so we learned a lot of missions around the Earth and the International Space Station, but if we go to the Moon or Mars, radiation doses are just getting more and longer exposures are also expected. Um, just as an idea, so astronauts in the space station, they accumulate on one day the same radiation dose as we all would accumulate in one year. So it's a factor 200, 300. If you go to Moon, Mars, we are even less protected by our Earth shield and we have even more radiation. But that shouldn't scare us a bit of radiation and we do have plans for human missions to moon and mars and also ESA. Um, so in that context just distance and time plays a very important factor so the exposure time but also the isolation from earth yeah, to to protect to upload to send supplies is a very important factor so as scientists and researchers, we have quite some challenges to answer in the future and where uh, we at SEK also work on with many different uh, groups. So wh what is the radiation we can expect and how we can measure it, how we can build actually shelters to protect instruments, but also humans and can we use moon rocks and regolits to do that. Uh, the tiny astronaut walking there, uh, how we can protect them better to stay healthy. So we stem them very healthy into space, but how do we keep them healthy in their missions? So issues on radiation protection, countermeasures. Um, also, how do we pr produce oxygen, water and food once we are there? So it's also biology. We need to transplant from Earth and make it work in a radiation environment. How do we make sure all communication or electronics still works? So how do we design rat heart uh, uh, electronics? Also, how do we do the energy question, a very contemporary question today, but also in space. And yeah, as a nuclear center, we do think also nuclear technology can help there. That last point is not new. Eh? So all the voyagers, uh, were equipped with nuclear batteries, also the rovers on Mars that we know and, and are running there today are equipped with nuclear batteries. Also Belgium can play a role in that. Um, so in the 60s there was even uh, production of radioisotopes that can be used for such uh, batteries. It unfortunately was never used for those applications because there were no programs at that time here in Europe. Uh, but it was put at good use for some um, uh, radioisotope uh, drug production. But the know-how, the technology is here, and SEK is now again exploring with uh, multiple companies in Belgium, but also outside Belgium, in France, etc., how we can um, yeah, do feasibility studies if we can give Europe the capabilities of uh, these energy sources as well, which currently doesn't uh, exist eh, in Europe, mainly it's NASA or Russian technology. Um, so good use of nuclear technology in space, but what me as a biologist uh, attracts is the, yeah, the negative impact of radiation and how can we deal with that. Uh, for that, we, for example, join missions like MARE mission, which is sending 
equipment around the moon to measure their radiation fields. It's an international mission of, of NASA, but with some European contributions. Uh, so there are torsos of human phantoms, um, which have tissues or materials that resemble tissues. We put a lot of radiation sensors in there and we measure radiation doses to really understand what is the impact on the body and on the different organs. Also the design or development of radiation protection vests uh, that's, that's going on. Uh, this is an Israeli uh, development. Maybe you see here that we are happy, or I'm at least happy to see that uh, it's uh, female torsos that they use. Uh, we heard that there is about 600 astronauts that flew, but only 10% of them are women. So there is a lot to discover what is the impact of space flight on female bodies and also on radiation protection. So we are very happy that this is included in this kind of research project. So there are also some uh, Belgium radiation sensors on there and research going on. Once we know the radiation field, we of course want to know what does it do on the body. So there is research going on on what radiation does on our uh, blood, on our immune system, on our skin, on uh, all our organs, uh, what is the risks for cancer, um, but also how we can prevent that or, or intervene, counter, pro provide countermeasures. Typically today, this is nutrition, exercise, exercise or medication, but the scientists of SEK together with expert teams all in Belgium as well, are thinking about the future and the questions are not always easy. There are maybe ethical aspects involved. So can we, for example, select astronauts who are more radiation resistant, so not all of you in this room have the same sensitivity. Some of you are dealing very well with radiations, others not. So can we maybe better select for those who, who, who deal with it better? Could we put them in hibernation? If you sleep, you are less sensitive. Um, can we think about gene therapy? Can we do uh, tissue engineering? So all these exciting questions, at least it's worthwhile to think about it and to see whether we can do research about it. So also there, Belgium and Flanders contribute in these studies. What about the food that we need in such missions? Um, so Belgium is a pioneer in a project for ESA, which is called MELISSA. Uh, which tries to develop actually a food production system, but also supplying water and oxygen by reusing waste in a circular way. The astronauts are the source of all the waste that we want to reuse um, and grow again uh, plants, food, but also algae. Uh, so there are many uh, different partners. It's an international project. I invite you to visit the website to learn more about it and also what all the Belgian institutes are doing uh, in this pro project. Um, yeah, it's challenges eh, that we also know on Earth. Uh, we are building synthetic ecosystems which are actually fully vegan. So an astronaut will be, per definition, through the ESA system, a, a vegetarian. Um, but it's agriculture in space, but free of soil, free of climate, free of seasons, night, day, night. So it's space biotechnology development for which we need engineers, modelers, uh, sensor development, etc. Uh, if you want to know more, join us at the conference which we organize in November in Toulouse, the Melissa conference. Uh, so check out the website and join us. Of course, this is development on ground, but we use ISS as the ideal test platform, and not only ISS, but also its astronauts um, are our test subjects for this research. So we flew um, multiple flight experiments, and as I said, the first one 20 years ago, 
Uh, for example, radiation uh, sensors inside, outside ISS, so it's these orange packages which is full of sensors at different locations in ISS, also outside to map, also during solar cycles, which areas are better protected, less protected, and of course the astronauts are our instruments to place all these things there. So again, international projects where we contribute. So uh, you see on the slide sometimes the names of the projects you can look up. Um, we are gathering here in September all the experts, international experts from ESA, NASA, Canada, uh, JAXA, to, to talk and discuss how we can do better radiation moni monitoring in ISS and for the future. We also poke astronauts to give their blood to analyze how, what the impact of radiation is. And in SEK, we try to figure out what makes one astronaut more sensitive than another. So analyzing blood pre-flight, in-flight, post-flight. Um, so thanks again to all <laughs> the donations for this kind of research. Um, there are only a few astronauts we can use as test subjects, so we also sent other organisms, other cells on board to figure out what makes a cell resistant sensitive and also if damage happens, does repair still go on correctly in space? So you can also visit these websites. These are Belgian, pure Belgian projects with rotifers in space, um, collaborations with universities as well. Um, flight of bioreactors to space to check how we can use algae. Uh, technology developed in Belgium with space companies like Kinetic, but also SIS has platforms to fly this, uh, to figure out how we can yeah, grow biology in a radiation environment in space over several missions. Um, this kind of knowledge brings us a lot of know-how on how to grow, how to preserve, how to store, reactivate, and have the best nutritional biomass, which we used for a, a more societal project, which we called Inspiration. So all our know-how on how to grow algae in space, we actually also uh, joined with that know-how an organization, Entrepreneurs for Entrepreneurs, and we support a humanitarian project to set up spirulina cultivation farms in Congo, a university farm, um, so that all the training on how to grow and how to harvest such crops, how to make sure it has of the good quality, that's also where we contribute. Um, of course, we are just one of the contributors, um, it's always open to have more members, more supporters for such projects, but for us as a scientist, it was very important that some of these high-tech technology we develop for 30 years from now has some kind of today uh, return also on Earth. Um, Biorock, uh, it's a, a step forward in space agriculture. How can we use lunar rocks? as mineral sources to grow crops. And so we test that in space, how, how microbes do that. But that kind of research we actually also used for uh, our space bakery initiative. Uh, it's a fully Flemish initiative, but actually, um, yeah, it's sparked by a company, a bakery company, who has hundreds of years of experience but wanted to think what about the next 50 years or 100 years? What bread are we going to eat in 100 years from now? And they said, okay, maybe then people are living on Mars and they are eating our bread. So what should a Mars bread look like and how should we make it? So it was a challenge of thinking and they brought together a consortium on developing hardware to produce indoor wheat and grain um, to have, if you're indoor, you can actually maybe use a six hour day cycle and have higher productivities, but it needs water, it needs resources. How do we deal with that? 
Um, also, how do we make sure that the grains we have have still high nutritional quality, is safe? So that's the kind of research we do in a, in a Belgium consortium here, very locally, but of course with a lot of aspects for technology development and return on earth, on circular uh, agriculture, um, uh, also, yeah, of course, impact of radiation, where it's also our role on seeds, on, on growth, on nutritive value. Um, so very interesting project, really. And also, I <laughs> invite you to visit our website there. Research is one thing, but yeah, I'm stepped in, for example, in a research project for space, and I will probably do it the rest of my career, but then it's not done. There is challenges for the next 30 years, maybe 50 years. So education, training on these topics we find also very important. So we are open to welcome students for stages, for theses, and so, and we are also organize a space summer school not in COVID times, but we hope to do it again. So visit our website. We also very happy we can contribute to many other activities like B Space, the Manama Master in Space Science Studies here in KUL, ESRO activities. Um, and I think it was a very nice uh, message last year that also Flanders region invest with Frank de Wiener FWO postdoc grants to stimulate actually young people, young creative minds to already think about space now. Uh, at SEK, we also engage in a new uh, initiative which is called Belgian Spaceship. Uh, we hope to create a kind of atelier where we can bring together uh, experts in space but also students uh, creative minds to think about challenges and how to solve them and as a part of actually an ESA program which was started by Frank I think uh, a, a fleet of uh, spaceships and, and similar uh, ateliers uh, in different countries. If you have any ideas you want to contribute, we are still looking how to create it, how to find the funds to, to have all the facilities. So always welcome for contributions. I also added one slide because I think what Belgium also does very well is not only focus on science and hard STEM, but also includes um, arts. And we have a very nice person, Angelo, a very creative mind who has created also organization like SEEDS, eh? so open creative workshops, and that's also part of space, which I think is very valuable. We think our research, and we hope, but I th really think also that it has applications on Earth, uh, and yeah, it is a usual exercise to check, yeah, what are we bringing for this sustainable, uh, goals development, and I crossed a number of them, but there is a much nicer video created by ESA, uh, by Thomas Pesquet, showing actually in the International Space Station how some of our algae research is fitting some of these sustainable goals, so please check out that video on YouTube. And then my last slide, all of this is not feasible through funding. Um, from ESA, from BELSPO, the Belgian science policy, of course, uh, Flanders organizations like Flanders Food, Flanders Space, the VRI, but none of this is what we do alone. All of this is what we do with others, so too many logos to put here, but Melissa Consortium, Space Bakery, the companies, um, uh, universities, so if you're in a university, check out. I'm sure your university is doing something in space for research. So, um, yeah, that's me. And then at the end, I just want to put up the contact info. All of this is not just me. It's many different groups in SEK. Um, and, but you can contact me if you want, and I will put you forward to all the other contacts uh, as well. So, yeah, thanks for your attention. Then uh, I would like to announce the third speaker of today. That's uh, Mr. Jens Kaufmann. 
Jens is heading the SME and Industry Analytics uh, section at the European Space Agency. Uh, welcome, uh, Jens. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having me um, um, at this date and uh, um, at this uh, prestigious place, which I can say is so far uh, the most beautiful university I personally have ever seen, so I envy all of you who can, uh, who can study here. Uh, then I think I can also apologize following a, following a presentation of such pertinence for, for space research and being the last obstacle uh, before the coffee break, uh, I will have to spend an effort to, to make it worth your while. Still, I believe um, um, what I'm going to present, even though it is more in the area of industrial policy, relates well to uh, what Kuhn and, uh, and uh, Frank have uh, presented before. Um, the presentation is actually split in two parts. I will explain a bit what we are doing for small and medium enterprises um, in the agency. Uh, for those who uh, don't really know the, um, um, the abbrevi abbreviation or the meaning, small and medium enterprises is a defined category of uh, companies uh, that have less than 250 employees and an annual turnover of about 50 million, million euros, uh, which makes it a specific uh, community. Um, I will explain a bit uh, more in detail. Um, just to give you an impression um, on why SMEs are relevant for the agency um, as a whole, we have over 3,000 of these um, uh, companies registered uh, with us already. Um, they receive almost 30% of all the contracts uh, the agency uh, uh, places. Uh, in total, we are talking about almost 1,400 companies that receive uh, contracts from us in a period of over five years. Uh, and what is important to know, and since it's also related to this place in a way, is that 50% of these companies are micro SMEs, being companies with less than 10 employees. Uh, how do we know? Because we, uh, we have an annual study uh, with the support of the um, uh, University of Leuven and SME for Space, where we analyze the economic situation of SMEs. Um, um, and this figure is relevant because it, I think it makes clear that um, these kind of companies need, need special attention um, concerning uh, their capability to, uh, uh, to do business with ESA. <clears throat> Looking at the, um, at the Belgian situation, uh, we can basically see, if you uh, try to remember the figures we had before, that the situation in Belgium is actually quite good. Uh, so in, uh, from a purely statistical point of view, um, um, and the Belgian SMEs are more involved than the average um, um, across, the, across the agency. Uh, you see here um, uh, we have um, almost 190 entities, uh, uh, entities contracted. You see also here the, um, the participation of the SMEs in the, in the various uh, program domains of the, um, um, of the agency. Um, on our part, who we are, the SME office, is implementing the, um, the industrial policy that the member states have defined uh, with the objective to uh, facilitate the involvement of small and medium enterprises in a sustainable way. Um, and this is an important aspect, uh, since as you have seen, um, SMEs represent a considerable share of the industry in all our, in all our member states. Um, the SME policy that we have basically has, has four pillars. I'm not going to, uh, to enter into the detail of all of them. Uh, I would rather present some more um, um, specific um, uh, measures that we do that are relevant for, for the industry um, 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 here present, sometimes also for, for the students. We have uh, um, general support measures. We have specific procurement measures that reflect um, um, the situation of SMEs, the difficulties they have in terms of um, um, getting involved in, uh, in our large programs, um, industrial policy measures um, um, that uh, support the, uh, the SMEs in being selected 
giving them a special room in certain programmatic areas, uh, as well as financial uh, as well as financial measures. And uh, <clears throat> I would just rather present some uh, um, some selected measures of what we do uh, concretely that I think are relevant for for companies. Um, um, and that is first, our training activities. We have a dedicated training platform which became very useful uh, in the time of the COVID crisis where, uh, where no present courses uh, uh, were possible anymore. I don't think I need to, to explain that to, uh, to anybody here in the room. And, um, and most of these training courses are directly focused on helping SMEs um, to improve their capability to do uh, business uh, with ESA in a variety of areas, and um, uh, this platform is, uh, is publicly accessible. All the training courses for industry are for free, and some of the resources you can find also or there may be even interesting uh, for, the, for the students in the room. Another important um, element, um, and you can imagine for a small company, the smaller you are, the more difficult it is to be involved in the community in particular in a multinational environment like ESA with uh, 22 member states. Um, we have specific networking measures and one uh, I would like to promote here today um, um, is the Industry Space Days. It's, um, I think, um, the largest B2B event um, um, for the space industry that we organize uh, in Europe and it takes uh, a place again this year in Aztec. Uh, we always had um, a strong Belgian participation. I can invite all of you again to participate also um, this year again. Um, another element that also relates to what I just uh, said before, uh, the networking and the possibility for SMEs to be more visible <coughs> and be um, uh, more easily integrated in, in the supply chain is what we call ESA Match. It is basically a platform that extends uh, the regular platform industry has to use when, uh, when working with us, but it allows the small um, companies, practically all the companies, to present their capabilities, their products and services um, towards all the other um, industry uh, that is registered with us. Um, and it supports building a partnership directly on the, um, on the platform. So it really facilitates the, um, um, the life for small and medium enterprises. There is also a public element to this site. So when you go to this link, uh, you can as well use it to, um, to search for companies in your area or across Europe, um, 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 if you so like. Now, coming to the second part, <coughs> the commercialization at ESA and uh, a new space, um, it was already mentioned, I think by Frank, the need for um, um, a renewed effort um, in this area. And I think he also showed with the, um, um, I think it was Kuhn who showed the graph of the, um, um, the turnover of the, um, um, the Flemish companies over the years relevant uh, with respect to, to ESA. Uh, when we talk about commercialization, I think it's fair um, and to start with the situation in terms of private investment. What you see here is just a global overview um, 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 indicating that uh, uh, about 12 billion of, of private investments were made in 2021. Um, and that is a significant, uh, significant increase. We can also see that the, uh, the private investment in Europe in space um, has increased at a, at a slower pace with um, um, just 14%. But when we now look on the next slide, that if we put in this into perspective, the, the 12 billion that have been invested, only 5% of that actually went to, to European companies. And this, uh, um, I think this is where we clearly see the link of uh, what was mentioned before, um, that here we need to advance and uh, uh, we really need to um, um, adapt um, 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 the approach in European space uh, to support these, uh, these private investments. Um, if it comes to the challenges um, um, of following a survey that was made, you can see that the challenges are seen um, um, in the area of reaching out to investors, the associated burden and delays, and the lack of knowledge of available options 
and it is in uh, in this area where we believe that the agency can can be of um, um, can be of support. Um, we shall also not forget, in a way, it was also indicated uh, with respect to commercial enterprises and competition uh, that we may face in human space transportation, that our industry is in competition in this global field as well, in view of um, the investment capabilities outside uh, Europe, and that's really something um, that we need to tackle. In terms of barriers perceived with respect to the commercialization in space, um, um, we have a number of, um, 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 of areas identified, one of which is clearly the, um, um, the ease of, of access to, to our support, our technical support, our facilities in the very early phases of, um, um, of a business idea. Um, a certain lack of support in terms of protecting the resulting intellectual property from, uh, from these activities. The access to the space business ecosystem, um, um, there you may see that um, um, some of the activities I presented before are, are geared towards uh, um, um, allowing companies to integrate much better into the, into the community. Speed, reactivity, and risk-averse culture of the agency. Risk-averse culture is maybe a bit provocatively put, uh, because uh, um, I'm pretty sure that um, our two distinguished astronauts will not accept any unnecessary risk in, uh, in their endeavors. Um, the, the, the trick will be for us to decide when to take what risk. I will come back to that uh, um, um, later as well. And of course, uh, the access to in-orbit demonstration and in-orbit uh, verification opportunities. That is not only um, an issue uh, with respect to commercialization, it's a general issue for small and medium enterprise. It, it is, um, I think, a straightforward um, uh, thing to say that whenever you can demonstrate, verify what you have developed, uh, its industrialization uh, will be much uh, facilitated vis-a-vis uh, -vis us, um, but also vis-a-vis -vis an investor that is much more willing to invest uh, in something that has been demonstrated in a relevant environment in, um, that is to say, space. To this extent, um, 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 the, in the agency, the organization has a bit adapted and a dedicated uh, commercialization department has been created, uh, of which I'm um, uh, with the SME office part of, that basically has the, um, um, the objective to to accompany um, 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 young companies, space entrepreneurs, uh, on their entire journey um, 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 towards the commercialization, commercialization of, of their ideas. Um, the vision is, as any vision must be, uh, very ambitious, as you can see. Um, uh, the idea is to host a large, dynamic, growing and competitive uh, space ecosystem by 2025. Um, that is um, 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 a considerable ambitious objective. Um, um, also, um, um, when you combine it with our intent to have the highest growth rate of private investment in space by 2025, which is not so, uh, uh, which is not so far away, and in general to stimulate um, um, uh, commercialization in our industry and to become an enabler as well as an anchor customer um, for new space activities. I will explain a bit later how this uh, uh, relationship um, uh, with new space um, 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 is seen by us. And of course, to, um, um, to tackle the, the issue that I mentioned in the beginning, and that is to definitely increase the share of private investments um, um, in the European space ecosystem up to 15%. 15 in order to do this, we have um, a number of uh, services uh, that we have foreseen so far in a number of areas. I'm um, uh, basically addressing the, um, the various topic um, that concerns um, innovation. Um, we can provide commercial advisory. I think that is also something that mentioned before. One of the, um, the capabilities, the virtues of the agency is, of course, the technical expertise that we can provide. Uh, we can provide these expertise to, to entrepreneurs, to startups, uh, but we can also provide these, uh, these expertise to financial institutions, public or, 
or private institutions. Um, you see here also the, um, the provision of funding for, um, uh, for IOD, IOV opportunities to finally create uh, regular service in this, um, um, in this area. Uh, the development of relationships um, uh, with the investor communities, um, be they uh, public uh, or private, and the establishment of a commercialization um, a policy which is important um, um, in the sense that um, uh, we as an agency and with all the directorates, we need to have some sort of guideline how we approach um, commercialization across the, um, across the activities of the agency. Um, coming back to the, the new space element that I mentioned before, I think here it's important to understand that uh, from our point of view, we don't want to create say a schisma of a new space versus old, old space companies. The way we see it is um, uh, that there's only a new space approach. There's absolutely no reason to assume that an established company um, cannot also uh, embark on, uh, um, um, on new space um, uh, projects. It is rather characterized by the, by the business mindset um, uh, behind it, uh, relying on, uh, on private investment and levering basically the, um, the aspects of speed, uh, being customer driven and uh, a new risk culture. I will not go too much into this. Um, um, but coming back to the, the risk aspect, I think for all of you, um, I'm knowing the business a bit, you know that uh, uh, being risk adverse is in the end one of the virtues that allowed us in the past to achieve um, um, a very um, complex missions, to achieve um, um, the men's trans men's space, trans space transportation activities that we did. Um, but it is not necessarily always required that we do that. In, um, um, in new space projects, the agency can assume a different role. Uh, we do not always need to be um, the own developer uh, specifying all the requirements, we can also be a customer. We can purchase a service. And um, in such approaches, it will be possible for the agency and our member states, of course, let's not forget that it's always in the end our member states that um, entitle us to do what we do, um, um, to take different risks um, and, and to follow different uh, development approaches. Um, last but not least, it was mentioned before that this year is also the year of the ministerial conference where the uh, member states decide on the new budget for, for our upcoming period. And for this uh, ministerial conference, we have a de dedicated uh, program uh, that we are currently elaborating and iterating with our member states, uh, which is called Scale Up. And the name is, um, um, is pro program in that it is mostly related to supporting the scaling up of, um, um, of commercial endeavors. I'm sorry. And it basically consists of, um, um, of two elements. The first one is, uh, is labeled innovate, and that, um, um, and that includes all the activities that we do in terms of business incubation, technology transfer, um, um, intellectual property protection. And then <coughs> um, the most important element in terms of uh, uh, private uh, investment is the invest element, and this is um, and the provision of our um, support to, uh, uh, to the community, um, the in-orbit demonstration opportunities, and of course the relationships with, uh, with the investor uh, community. So that, that brings me to the, to the end of the, um, um, the presentation, it brings you to the coffee break. And uh, here you will find uh, some additional information both on, um, um, on the SME aspects I presented and, um, and the commercialization gateway, uh, which is a web page um, um, dedicated to the activities um, I presented in the second half of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So this indeed brings us uh, to the coffee break. Uh, You're all very welcome to uh, have a look at the job fair and we reconvene here at uh, 4.15. Uh, See you in uh, about half an hour. <laughs>